Welcome back to Unit 8, Thermodynamics. Lesson 1 is going to be on heat, energy, and temperature. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about energy, temperature, and we're also going to refer to Table I. So make sure your reference tables are handy. So what is thermodynamics? It's a study of heat changes that occur during chemical reactions. Energy, by definition, is the capacity to do work or to produce heat, which is signified by a Q. Kinetic energy is energy that is physically in motion. Potential energy is stored energy within bonds or within the atom itself. Heat is measured in joules. Joules is like saying inches or meters. It's just a measurement of heat. You'll sometimes hear it being referred to as kilojoules. Heat will always flow from the hotter body to the cooler body from high concentration of heat to low concentration of heat. Think of osmosis. Osmosis always went from high concentration to low concentration. Same idea. Temperature changes are a measurement of the average kinetic energy of matter. So as we mentioned, heat is measured in joules. Um, it can also be measured in calories. In I'm sure you've heard of a calorie before. However, in the United States, we measure things in kilocalories, which is a capital C if you notice a difference. Um, so 1,000 calories is equivalent to 4,180 joules. If you've ever been abroad to a different country, you'll notice that they use kilocalories on their labeling or they'll use the joule. So here's just a region's question that might pop up. In a laboratory, a student makes a solution by completely dissolving 80 grams of KNO3 in 100 grams of hot water. Remember, ionic compounds will dissolve in polar water. The resulting solution has a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. The room temperature in the laboratory is 22 degrees Celsius. So what direction will the heat flow? Okay, so again, heat will always flow from a hotter body to a cooler body. So the heat will flow from the 60 degrees Celsius towards the 22 degrees Celsius. This is what we refer to as exothermic because the system, which is the solution that the scientist is holding in the picture, is warmer and releasing heat to the cooler elements around. So temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. So all of the particles that are in the sample. So we're not just looking at one little particle. Now the law of conservation of energy is similar to the law of conservation of matter, of mass. It's the same idea over and over and over again. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. So it has to come from somewhere. Energy has no mass, but we can feel its effects because we can feel it in terms of heat on occasion. Uh, light is also a type of energy. Chemical potential energy is the amount of energy stored inside of a substance. It's determined by the kind of atoms and the arrangement or the vesper of those atoms. So this is just a chart that explains the different types of energy that can be found within the bonds of carbon dioxide. So now please take out your reference table so you can look at this chart. Table I is the heats of reaction at 101.3 kilopascal and 298 Kelvin. Notice that it's not quite the standard temperature. So a lot of times on the Regents exam, they'll specifically reference those two values. You need to understand that it is always reflecting table I's information. So heat of reaction is the amount of heat that must be added or removed during a chemical reaction in order to keep all the substances present at the same temperature. So you'll notice that uh, on the right column there's a delta H. If the delta H or the change of heat is positive it refers to something called endothermic. Endo meaning the heat is entering the system. Now if you see a negative delta H or a negative heat of reaction or change of heat that's referring to something that is exothermic, meaning that the heat is leaving the reaction. It's a product. 
as opposed to it being a reactant. Now, something that you should always notice that at the bottom of table I, all the way, all the way at the bottom, you'll see that it actually tells you that a minus sign does indicate an exothermic reaction. So you don't have to memorize negative means exothermic. An endothermic reaction is a process where the system absorbs heat from the surroundings. So again, heat is entering the system. It's going to be reflectant as a reactant. That means heat goes into the system, counts as a reactant. So heat of the system, which is the positive delta H, the positive heat of reaction, you're always going to see that it increases. So that's what you see in this chart. The products, therefore, will hold more energy than the reactants originally had. Now you're going to see a positive value on table I because the heat is going into the system. To us, the object is going to feel cold. Now the reason why it feels cold is actually because it's stealing our body heat. So here's an example of an endothermic reaction. Gaseous nitrogen and oxygen plus energy forms nitrogen monoxide. Okay. Now you'll notice that the word plus energy is on the reactant side of our equation, which again signifies an endothermic reaction. But if you notice the delta H, you'll also see that it has a positive value for the kilojoules, which means again, endothermic reaction. Here's an endothermic physical equation. Again, you'll observe that there's the word energy on the reactant side. When you add energy to solid water, it will melt and form into water liquid. Okay, again, you'll see that the delta H is noted by a positive value. Another example is when liquid water absorbs energy to turn into gaseous water. Again, another positive value for delta H, again, noting that it's endothermic. Now, an exothermic reaction is a process where the system loses heat to the surroundings, which means heat is leaving or going out of the system. Now, when we look on table H, this is going to be something that has a negative delta H, which means the heat of the reaction actually decreases. It's going to show negative value on table I, and it's going to feel hot to us because in this case, the system is losing its heat and we are the ones absorbing it. When we look at one of these potential energy diagrams, we're going to see that the heat of the reactants is going to be a lot higher than the heat of the products. This tells us that reactants have to lose energy to create the products at the end. Here's an example. Methane with oxygen forms carbon dioxide and water plus energy. This is a very common combustion reaction. Notice that there's plus energy is a product which means it is leaving the system just like the other two products are. We're going to have a negative delta H so on table I you're, you're going to see that negative value. Here's just an example of some physical equations where water liquid becomes water solid. In order for water liquid to turn into ice, it's going to have to lose a lot of heat. And that's why we see the plus energy as a product. Same idea when gaseous water or steam turns into liquid, we're going to need it to lose energy and cool down. So looking at table I, let's pick this uh, carbon and oxygen forming carbon dioxide ex uh, example. This is an exothermic reaction because as we can see, it's a negative 393.5 kilojoules of energy. So that means it's going to be releasing energy. This is for the forward reaction. If we refer to the reverse reaction, the opposite would occur. So what is a product will turn into a reactant. What is a reactant will now turn into a product, which includes where the heat is or where the energy is. So if this is a negative delta H, 
negative implies that it's exothermic, so it actually counts as a product. Now, if we reverse the reaction, again, what is a product becomes a reactant. So now it becomes an endothermic process of 393.5 kilojoules.